just a bit of a content warning before we go into this fic. This fic is rated mature and has an archive warning for underage, as well as tags for dubious consent, uninformed consent, and manipulation. Uh, this fic isn't really explicit in any way, and mainly just some awkward teenage fumblings, but it is the closest I've gotten to any explicit content in the video before, so I thought I would warn you all before you go into it. The link to the fic will be in the description if you want to go and check out the full tags before starting. Now, oh, please enjoy this beautiful fic. The Cost of Survival Written by Doshu and read by Eleanor Elizabeth Summary Peter likes the way that people look at him because he's a marauder. He likes the way that he's invited along to get-togethers during the summers, the way that people pass him drinks and snacks at Quidditch after-parties, the way that people don't laugh about him when he's within earshot. He likes the way that everyone knows who he is and pretends to like him, but he likes the way that Barty treats him even more. Peter's eyes were scratchy as he yawned, and he only managed to shield his mouth when it opened even wider with a second yawn that practically cracked his jaw. Thankfully, it was a Saturday, and he didn't have to be mentally alert and physically functioning high in the sky on a broom, not like James, who had Quidditch practice first thing in the morning after a long night of no sleep. And the next full moon would be during the Christmas holiday, on Christmas Day, in fact, which was a shame for Remus, but at least none of them would have classes to worry about. He was just debating resting his head on the start of his transfiguration essay, and not quite accidentally taking a nap, when movement in the corner of his eye caught his attention. He blinked the library around him into focus to see a tall, lanky figure approaching him with an armful of books. "'Mind if I sit here?' the boy asked. Peter blinked a few more times, taking in the Ravenclaw robes, the round freckled face, and the bright hazel eyes beneath a mop of blonde hair. Not anyone in his year as far as he was aware. Sure, Peter finally said, waving vaguely at the seat across from him. It took the other boy a few moments to set his books down before sitting and pulling out what looked to be notes about potions ingredients. Once sounds of rustling parchment filled the air, Peter turned back to his own work. They spent the next half hour together in relative silence, immersed in their own assignments and revision. Peter was just flipping through a crumbling tome to double-check a reference when the sound of a throat clearing drew his attention across the table. This might seem like an odd question. The boy started, his tone slightly hesitant, while his gaze flitted over Peter's face. But you're Pettigrew, right? Peter Pettigrew? He nodded slowly, something like resignation settling in his gut. Of course. Next he'd be asked about Sirius, or James, and that would be that. The Peter Pettigrew who got the highest grade in the past decade on the arithmetic owl, the boy added. The thing in his gut clenched, and he couldn't help the way he froze for a moment, startled by the unexpected turn of the series of questions. Wait, what was that? The boy bit his lip. That's what Aryabhata said, and, well, I looked up the records at the Ministry over the summer to know what I'd be expected to. He trailed off and looked down for a moment, his fringe flopping into his eyes briefly before he straightened in his seat once more. Aribiata said that you were the best she'd seen since she started teaching here. Peter's mouth twisted as his stomach squirmed. He'd achieved an outstanding on that OWL. He'd known that much, but to hear that his professor was apparently praising his work to other students, that she was talking about him... That's news to me, he managed, feeling almost exposed in the quiet corner of the library. So, did you need something? And that question opened the floodgates. Before long, he learned that the boy, Barty Crouch, had a father with ridiculous expectations, that he was going for twelve, twelve OWLs, that he was under unreasonable amounts of pressure, some of it imposed by his father, but from the sounds of it, plenty of it was self-imposed too. And, well, when Peter learned that Barty's father was that Crouch, head of the Department of Magical Law Enforcement, 
that nervous tension in his stomach eased a little. He'd been noticed, singled out, but it was fine. And when faced with the hopeful smile of the boy across the table from him, the boy who apparently wanted to pick his brain, who wanted to talk to him, and wasn't just cozying up in order to get to his more popular friends, Peter found a smile of his own. All right, he said. One of the things that helped me most was using the Agrippin method for the initial decryption, rather than relying on the Chaldean table that was in the course text. They continued to meet in the library. Remus would also occasionally join them when he wasn't recuperating after a full moon, or off doing secret things with Sirius. Peter was used to watching the people around him, so he noticed the way that Barty wouldn't really chat when Remus was present, and would only ask the odd question every now and again. He also noticed that, the closer they got to the Christmas holidays, the less energetic Barty was, almost seeming to curl in on himself and revise even more furiously for exams that were still six months away. Because he was used to watching people, he knew that he'd seen that same hunted look on Sirius's face for years before he'd finally run away. Though, of course, he'd coped by lashing out with more reckless, almost aggressive jokes on other students, rather than becoming more studious. And so, when the student populace piled into the stadium to watch the Quidditch match the day before the Hogwarts Express would be bringing most of them home to their families, Peter chose a seat near the divide between Gryffindor and Ravenclaw, pretending not to hear the way that Sirius and Remus muttered to each other about why they weren't sitting in their usual spots. The stands filled in around them. Peter was given odd looks, some of them even momentarily disdainful, before the onlookers noticed Sirius sitting beside him, and plastered on smiles instead. He endured the way that some of the students making their way to their seats pointedly squeezed past him, acting as though Peter took up far more room than he actually did. He hated attending these matches, but it was a thing that he did. Like most other things, he was one of the marauders, and that was the best shot he had at staying out of the mess of the war, the best chance he had at not being noticed for anything he didn't want to be. And being a marauder meant supporting James with his Quidditch and being a proud Gryffindor. He was pulled out of his thoughts by a creak from the bench as someone sat next to him. Glancing over, he saw Barty's straw blonde hair just peeking out from beneath the blue and bronze wool hat, and his hazel eyes that were positively sparkling with excitement. Hi, Peter, Barty said cheerily. He then glanced past Peter and gave a small wave to Remus and Sirius, who had briefly fallen silent, then looked back at him. Their height difference was always less noticeable when they were sitting, though Peter was very aware of the fact that Barty was squished in next to him, their legs pressed together beneath the bulky layers of their cloaks. Peter shifted slightly, trying to give the other boy a bit more room, and not succeeding in the slightest. "'Who are you cheering for today?' he asked once his friends had resumed their conversation. Barty shrugged. "'I'm not sure it really matters if Ravenclaw isn't playing.' I suppose I could cheer for Hufflepuff, since Birch is pretty decent. Then his eyes somehow brightened further, and he added, Or I could cheer for Gryffindor with you. There was a swell of sound in the stadium around them, as the two teams emerged and began flying for their warm-up laps. He took the opportunity to look away from Barty, feeling the other boy's attention burning into him. Trying to shake off whatever that was unsettling him, Peter shifted in his seat again, shrinking slightly when Sirius nudged him back and muttered, "'Are you all right?' Peter nodded. "'Yeah, fine.' He wasn't fine. The Quidditch match was a blur. He was aware of Gryffindor doing decently well, and James scoring plenty of goals. Not because he was seeing them, really, but because each time it happened, Barty would turn towards him with a dimpled grin, then cheer just as loudly as the Gryffindors nearby. His palms were sweating, and he had them planted firmly in his pockets, the outside of his left leg burned where it was pressed against Barty's. It felt like a quick match, though the sun had travelled quite far in the sky by the time the Hufflepuff seeker was flying a circuit around the pitch with the snitch held aloft. Next to him, Sirius was already getting restless. At least this means I probably won't have to put a stop to a party that gets out of hand, Remus says, the words punctuated by a sigh. You know that we won't hear the end of it, Sirius replied and it will probably increase the number of matches per week, at least until the next match. Hopefully, it shouldn't be a problem, Peter pointed out quietly, 
keeping his words vague given their surroundings, but well aware of the direction his friend's thoughts had been headed. Remus nodded warily. Next weekend falls in March, but that's in the middle of Easter break. He should be able to get his sleep before practice. The stands were starting to empty. As the other two marauders got to their feet and followed the other students in their row to the stairs, Peter made to rise as well and was stopped by a hand on his arm. Do you mind staying for a minute? Barty asked quietly. He turned back and saw that all of the delight that filled his expression during the match was now absent, and instead the blonde was slouching, almost small in his seat. Sure, what's going on? Barty made a non-committal sound as the seats continued to empty around them. Once they were the last ones remaining in the section, he looked around furtively before clearing his throat. I'll be going home for the holidays. Barty began in his halting tones. My father will want to know that I'm focusing on my studies. He frowned. You are focusing on your studies. Yes, but... Barty fell silent, and he played with one end of his muffler, not meeting Peter's gaze. Barty, you spend time in the library every day. I don't know what you Ravenclaws get up to in your tower, but I'm sure you do more revising there too. What's there to be worried about? The other boy looked around again, his gaze lingering on the pockets of students that still remained, a few in the Hufflepuff section near the staff box, a small cluster across the pitch in the Slytherin section. If I mention that you're helping me with arithmetic, would you be okay with that? Peter shifted slightly, putting a bit of space between them finally and facing Barty on the bench next to him. The idea of being talked about grated on him, made the hair on the back of his neck stand on end. Why? Why would it matter to him? And honestly, you don't really need my help. You'll get an outstanding in the OWL without me. Barty continued to stare across the pitch. Peter huffed slightly and faced forward again. Then he sealed himself as he admitted quietly. Don't really like it when people talk about me. I'd much rather blend in. I don't... I don't want to be noticed. He could feel Barty's gaze on him, but he couldn't face it. His insides were in writhing, awful knots, and the lining of his pockets were damp where he was gripping the cloth with his hands. There were only six months left until he finished Hogwarts. Six more months until most of the year would receive their last recruitment pitch, or be marked as an enemy of the cause. And all Peter hoped for was to fall somewhere in the middle of those two options, unnoticed, and simply survive. I won't tell him, Barty finally said. I'd like to reassure him that I'm focusing on school, that I'm not falling in with the wrong crowd, but... It's fine. I won't tell him. Peter nodded his thanks, and tried to ignore the way that his stomach twisted when Barty laid a reassuring hand on his knee. Barty wrote letters. It was a shock to him when the first thing out of his mum's mouth on Boxing Day was, Peter, you didn't tell me you made a new friend. Should I invite them over? At first, he'd been bewildered, since the marauders never exchanged letters over Christmas. During the summer, yes, the post was how they arranged get-togethers, since only James and Sirius had those charmed mirrors, and the flu could be a hassle if they weren't home to receive the call. But his name was written in a script, that he only knew from seeing it across the table in the library within the past month. He accepted the letter from his mum with a confused frown. Is everything all right, dear? He nodded, then looked up at her with a smile. Sure, I just wasn't expecting anything while I was here. I'll open it later. Breakfast was more or less normal, though he noticed his parents exchanging looks that he imagined they believed to be surreptitious throughout. They probably thought he fancied someone, and that he was receiving love letters or something. He ignored the looks, and once the meal was over, he retreated to his room, where he sat on the bed to unfold the parchment. Dear Peter, Happy Christmas! I hope you're enjoying the holidays with your family. They looked really happy to see you at the platform. I didn't say anything. My father's quite busy with work, so I imagine he's too distracted to notice anyway. But you can trust me. My mother and I will be at the New Year's Eve celebration in Diagon Alley, if you're going and you wanted to say hello, I'd like that. But if you prefer not to, I'd understand. Either way, I hope you're doing well. And I'll see you when we're back at Hogwarts. Best wishes, Barty. He read the letter three times before he folded it up 
and dropped his chin to his fist. This was... odd. It was clear that Barty was latching on to Peter. He'd seen the blondes with some of his yearmates, but none of them seemed especially close. But over the past month, he'd started spending time with Peter almost daily. It brought back that nervousness, that sense of feeling seen. Except Barty was obsessed with academics above all else. He was friendly and open and genuine, and his dad ran the bloody DMLAE. Peter huffed and flopped back onto his bed. He was being daft. Not everything was about him. This was clearly about Barty, and this was his way of coping with the pressure of family. Peter knew all about that from watching Sirius handle his own family pressure, though his coping mechanism had always been vastly different. Striving for perfection versus chasing after the exact opposite of that. He sent off a response, rolling his eyes when his mum made happy humming sounds. And the break continued, with a visit from his aunts and their daughter, and a trip to the Potters to see James and Sirius, while the adults gossiped about current events. Then, as the remaining days of the year dwindled, it was time for what was both his most anticipated and most dreaded part of their holidays, their winter visit to Grandfather Nathaniel. They always waited until several days after Christmas itself for the occasion, if only to spend more time actually with his grandfather, and less enduring the hectic mania of St Mungo's during holiday season. This year was no different, though they travelled by flu, rather than wandering through crowds of muggles in London. He'd noted his father listening to the news broadcast on the wireless that morning, and he'd seen lines of tension in each of his parents' faces as they checked that they had everything they needed before stepping into the fireplace. The Janus Thicky Ward had one more empty bed than it had the last time they'd visited. Peter felt something heavy settle over him, even though he hadn't known the patient who'd been there in his previous visits for as long as he could remember. But simply knowing that she was likely not fully recovered, not sitting at home with her family. They arrived at his grandfather's bed and stepped past the curtain barrier. His dad conjured an extra chair, since there was only two set out. They each had their greetings, and his mum started them off with light-hearted chatter about how the family was doing. It wasn't a good day. They never knew ahead of time. It was impossible to plan for. Sometimes Grandfather Nathaniel was alert and responsive and engaged. There had even been an occasion or two where the old man insisted on going on a walk around the hospital. Peter remembered being quite young, and his grandfather had held his hand and led him up to the tea room where he'd bought him a jammy dodger the size of his head. Then there were other visits, like this one, when his grandfather didn't seem to even see them there. They stayed through the morning and into the start of the afternoon. Near one o'clock, his dad started making noises about lunch, and his parents stood, beginning to say their farewells. Peter shook his head. You two go. I'd like to stay a little longer. Are you certain, dear? Surely you're hungry. He probably was. But he knew that with what was on his mind, with what he needed to get off his chest, anything he ate wouldn't sit well anyway. I'll be fine. Please, Mum. Let the boy have a moment with his grandfather, Patricia. Son, we'll see you at home, no later than three. Thanks, Dad. He tilted his head to return the kiss his mum pressed to his cheek, and smiled grimly at the weight of his dad's palm on his shoulder. Then he listened as their footsteps receded, and finally, as the door to the ward fell shut with a dull thump. I wish you were here right now, he said quietly, leaning forward, elbows on his knees and hands folded under his chin. I wish you could tell me what you would do. He looked at his grandfather's hands that were folded over the pale yellow blanket. They were knobbly, with deep-set wrinkles. They reminded him of an ancient tree, the way that the bark would surround the knots and tell the story of its life. Hands that had broken curses on ancient estates, had protected homes from unwelcome living dead and other horrific entities. Hands that kept people safe. Hands that had taken the brunt of a surge of dark magic years ago, preventing the others in the area from being harmed, but becoming the shell of the person he once was in exchange. Hands of a brave man. A true Gryffindor. I don't have much time left at Hogwarts. The others are already talking about signing up with Dumbledore and fighting. But we keep hearing about trained auras being killed, 
their families being tortured and made examples of and Peter closed his eyes and exhaled slowly. I'm scared. And I feel like I don't have enough options. But at the same time, I can't choose from the ones I do have. There's that apprenticeship offer, but it's in West Germany, and it doesn't feel right to be that far from home with everything that's going on. And my newts can probably get me a clerk position in the ministry, but even if I worked in filing, I'm pretty sure that would paint a target on my back. And... I know that there's a push there to transfer employees to the aura office, and I don't. He dropped his face into his palms, pressing his fingertips into his forehead, focusing on those individual points of pressure and using that to try and centre his thoughts. I don't want to fight, because I'm not strong at it. I know that, but I still feel like I have to. Like James and Sirius will be disappointed in me if I don't, and Remus will just feel even guiltier. Like somehow him not being on the front lines because of his condition is the reason behind me not wanting to be up there as well. Which is nonsense, but I know how he thinks. And everyone just expects the four of us to stick together. Hell, I've got myself convinced half the time. But I'm not like them. They're so. Peter fought to take a breath. He choked on air as it entered his lungs, and it stuttered on its way back out. His arms were trembling and he felt like he was going to be sick. They're not afraid, he finally managed, of anything. And I wish I could be like that. But I'm not. And I try, and I pretend. But it's not me. He bit his lip, and screwed his eyes shut even tighter. It's not me, he repeated in a whisper. It was a cool touch to his arm, and he flinched so hard his chair went clattering backwards, and he found himself on his feet, staring into his grandfather's open eyes. The man's arm was extended, and those long, gnarled fingers were wrapped around Peter's wrist. "'Your parents,' his grandfather said, his voice raspy. "'They left, Grandfather.' Peter glanced at his pocket watch, then looked back up. "'Just over twenty minutes ago.' "'Your parents!' he repeated more intently. Don't forget they need you. Peter blinked, then nodded slowly. He stepped closer to the bed and shifted his arm in Grandfather's grasp so that he could hold his hand. I won't, Grandfather. That's why I don't want to accept that apprenticeship. They need you to live. The hand tightened almost painfully around his for a few long seconds, then loosened and Grandfather Nathaniel's face fell lax once more as his eyes slipped shut. Peter swallowed and waited, hardly breathing, but his grandfather didn't wake up again. Still, it took him some ten minutes before he reclaimed his hand, righted his chair, and left the ward. Peter didn't end up going to the New Year's festivities in Diagon Alley. No one did, since early that morning there was an attack, and while the fighting itself didn't take place anywhere near London, countless families felt the losses. Abbots, Gamps, Foley's. More families still with names that weren't as known, but which had ties to those which were. Yet more muggle casualties and destruction. More terror. When Peter's parents saw him off in the new year as he boarded the Hogwarts Express, he could feel the chill on the platform. Not from the winter, but from the uncertainty in the air. There was less uncertainty once he found his friend's compartment, since Sirius was in a heated discussion with James, while Lily and Remus looked on with pinched looks on their faces. What did I miss? Peter asked quietly, once he finished stowing his trunk. They're talking about joining the Order of the Phoenix, Lily replied, not looking away from the two very loud boys. They sound like they're arguing, but really they're both making the same points. Peter glanced over and took in the wild light in Sirius's eyes and the disarray of James's hair. Then he sat next to Remus. So they're joining then? Remus nodded. We all are. They think we should be able to join now, but, well, it doesn't really matter, does it? We're in school anyways till the end of June. I'm not sure what I'll be able to help with, but if the headmaster will have me, I'm in. Peter nodded distractedly as loud voices carried on in the small compartment. He wondered how the Potters had reacted to that decision, or if they even knew that their son 
that they'd been so fortunate to have so late in life, wanted to go fight in a war. He wondered if Lily's parents knew that there was a war going on, if they could even understand such a thing when it came to people with magic. He wondered if Sirius had considered the fact that one day he might be stuck dueling his own brother if the rumours were true. He wondered about Remus's situation with his father, more distant than ever since his mum died the previous summer, and how things might change further should his friend join a war that could very well bring him face to face with Fenrir Greyback once more. He didn't notice that they'd pulled out of the station and they were hurtling along the countryside until the compartment door slid open. Anything from the trolley, dears? Peter bought a licorice wand and nibbled at the end. It wasn't long before Lily and James stepped out in the corridor to take care of head boy and head girl duties, and a little while later, Remus left as well for his hour of prefect rounds. When it was only Peter and Sirius left in the compartment, a mound of sweets wrappers between them, he cleared his throat. Can I ask you a question? Sirius looked up from where he was idly folding a chocolate frog card into a tiny triangle. Sure, what is it? What was it like? He knew the words were vague, and hesitated even as his friend's expression turned curious, and he looked down at his hands as he continued. Leaving home? Your family? What was it like? There was the sound of Sirius exhaling sharply, and Peter knew that his face was darkening with the unwelcome topic. But at the same time, he needed to know, from someone who'd chosen something else apart from family. What is it, Peter? Sirius sounded almost subdued, which was unusual for him. Did your parents do something to you? Are you all right? Peter shook his head. It's nothing like that. They're great, I just... He thought of Grandfather Nathaniel, and his words of caution, the weight behind them, a weight that he still felt choking on him now that he was away from his house, heading back towards what might be his last six months of freedom. He looked out the window, not seeing the relatively flat part of the Midlands they were travelling through, its fields blanketed in snow. I'm just thinking about after we finish at Hogwarts, and if I leave home, what was it like? Sirius sighed. I grabbed my things late one night and I left, travelled by flu to the leaky cauldron and stayed the night there. Then, in the morning, I talked to James through the fire and moved in with the potters that day. It was over before I realised it. It sounded so simple. And yet, in the year and a half that Peter had occasionally witnessed the two black brothers' paths crossing in the castle since that summer, he knew it was more complicated than that. It's odd. Sirius said a few minutes later. I'll miss the strangest things, and I still feel like a stranger in the Potter's house, if that makes any sense. But I don't regret it. He then let out a bark of laughter. How could I? Every second there was wretched. They're all horrible people, every last one of them. That didn't really help Peter sort through his thoughts. And when he was thinking back to his grandfather's words yet again, his friend spoke up. You're joining us, right? We all said that we're in once our newts are done. The order? He caught his friend's nod in the reflection of the glass. I'll think about it. I don't know how my parents will feel, though. Me rushing off to fight. They can fight, too. But they've got the shop. Sod them, then. You're of age. You don't have to listen to them. Peter blinked at the rising tone of Sirius's voice, then turned to face him. I don't... I mean... They're not like your parents, Sirius. He knew that the words were wrong the instant he said them, and he flinched at the wounded look that flashed across his friend's face. A few seconds later, he was alone in the compartment, the sound of the door banging shut ringing in his ears. Apart from some brief words during the announcement that preceded the evening meal, there was nothing to indicate that anything had happened during the holidays. For the most part, the students were smiling, as though happy to be part of this bubble of safety and innocence in an otherwise war-torn country. Well, war-torn might have been an exaggeration, but the almost determined falseness of the levity in the air pressed in around him until Peter too pretended that everything was fine. And he also smiled, because the marauders were a happy group of friends who laughed and played jokes and were the source of cheer for Gryffindor. 
He smiled all the way through the first week of classes, through the time spent in the common room, through a quick jaunt through the tunnels into Hogsmeade, well after curfew on Thursday. He didn't make it to the library until Sunday afternoon, where he found Barty sitting alone at their table. Peter hesitated as he rounded the corner and saw him there, then shook himself slightly and closed the distance, taking a seat in his usual spot. "'Oh, hi!' Barty said, a smile lighting up his face. "'Wasn't sure if I'd see you here. You've been busy all this week?' His mouth twisted guiltily. "'Yeah, I'm sorry. Time got away from me, and—' He tried to think of the reason he'd waited almost a week to come. He'd spent most of the time with his friends, but all the same, he hated doing classwork in Gryffindor Tower, since it was so easy to get distracted there, especially since the sniggers and comments had a way of finding their way to his ears when people thought he wasn't paying attention. "'Don't worry about it,' Barty told him, and he didn't say anything further. "'How was your break?' It was fine. Nice, actually. Until the Daily Prophet came in on the 31st, anyhow. It was a small shift, but he spent so much time with Barty in the weeks before the break that Peter noticed the way the corner of his eyes went tight and the way that something stiffened briefly in his neck. Yours? he asked. Barty set down his quill and looked down, worrying his lip. It was clear that he was trying to come to a decision of some kind. What Peter didn't expect was for him to draw his wand, then silently cast a spell with a wand movement that he didn't recognise. Sorry, it's just I don't really want anyone to overhear us, because of who my father is, you know? Peter momentarily wondered what spell he cast, since there wasn't a barrier nearby to affix an imperturbable charm to, and any other charms that might be useful similarly wouldn't be able to find purchase in the corner of the library. But then he focused on the boy in front of him when he straightened in his seat, a look of determination in his eyes. My father. Well, he spent some time at home over the break. Not much, but when he was there he was... frightening, almost. I don't know that I've seen him like that before. He's always been intense, but not like this. Peter frowned. You mentioned maybe going to Diagon Alley with your mum before the attack happened and things were cancelled. How was she? She's been ill. She's only up and about for a few hours each day. And don't misunderstand, my father didn't harm us or anything. But the way he's talking about the war. Barty's gaze cut away. He just gets so angry. I imagine he's under pressure because of the losses in his department? Barty nodded. And the fact that they're slow to receive pertinent information. And the fact that every proactive effort of theirs is anticipated. And more, no doubt. But he... The blonde bit his lip again, and then he looked back at Peter. After a moment of visible indecision, he said, He talks about his auras like they're numbers. Talks about everyone like they're just a number. Peter opened his mouth to ask the obvious question, but managed to stop himself in time. Then Barty spoke the words for him. I'm just a number to him. And something inside him lurched. It might have been pity, or sympathy, or even empathy in a way. Not because he was treated the same by his parents, because he wasn't, not by a mile, but instead because he was completely accustomed to being seen as a unit, a thing attached to the very real people that were the rest of the marauders, which was fine for him, because it was the best that he could hope for, but not for Barty, who was bright and cheerful and who loved Quidditch and learning and who wanted to be the absolute best that he could be, and certainly not from his own family. He didn't know what to say in the face of that, just as he'd never known what to say to Sirius when he returned from holidays or summers spent at home and share the tiniest fragments of what he'd been made to endure. Instead, he drudged up a fragment of something that might have been bravery and allowed himself to be a little vulnerable, just as Barty had done. I'm worried about what happens after Hogwarts, he said, forcing himself not to look away. My friends expect me to fight, and I know that I should, but at the same time. He shook his head and lowered his voice. I just want to survive. The things that are being done to some of the targets, the ones that are being used as examples. Barty, I just can't. It's war, actual war. 
If auras are being killed, what use am I? Barty looked at him. Neither of them said anything for what felt like ages. Peter was hardly breathing, yet he felt like he'd run a mile, and he couldn't quite catch his breath. He was very aware of the words that he'd just spoken, words that may as well be blasphemous from a Gryffindor, from anyone without Death Eater ties, really. He was also aware that he had no clue what spell Barty had cast to protect their conversation from curious ears. Then, just as he was considering the merits of packing up his things and bolting, Barty reached a hand across the table and clasped one of his tightly. I understand, Barty all but whispered. I want to survive too. They continued to spend time together in the library, but despite that new understanding they shared, neither Peter nor Barty brought up the topic of the war again. Still, he felt almost anxious when Remus would join them, as though the other Gryffindor would discover the admissions that had been shared and expose him to the rest of their friends. The first full moon of the year came near the end of January, on a Tuesday, and it was all Peter could do to get through his classes the next day and through the rest of the week. He was still exhausted and somewhat irritable when the weekend arrived and most of the upper years trudged through the snow to Hogsmeade. He felt a spike of something like jealousy, but nastier, when he spotted Barty and Regulus Black in a narrow alleyway between Scrivenshafts and the post office, having a heated conversation, given the scowls that they were both sporting. Peter waved at James and Lily distractedly when they took off towards Honeydukes, and trailed behind Sirius and Remus as they continued on towards Zonko's, most likely. He strained his hearing, but something about the thick snow seemed to be muffling the words from the alley, turning them into nothing more than a faint buzzing. Or, whatever spell Barty had cast in the library a few weeks earlier was in effect again, this time keeping whatever they were discussing secret. He managed to dawdle for too long, since a shop door banging open nearby caught both of the younger boys' attention and they looked up and quickly spotted Peter loitering. Feeling very much like a rat in a trap, he gave a small wave to Barty and watched as Regulus spoke a few more inaudible words before turning and leaving through the back of the alley. Then Barty cast what was visibly a finate and made a jerking motion with his head as though to beckon Peter closer. He approached, that bitter jealousy lingering in the back of his throat. When he was standing in front of Barty, he suddenly felt very small. The blonde had easily half a foot on him, if not more, and he didn't even know what had made him so upset. Barty took a step closer to him, glanced around furtively and said, He wasn't bothering me. I was just talking to him about... about... He cast that privacy spell again, Peter assumed. A moment later, Barty grabbed his hand and dragged him further into the alley, until they were mostly shielded from the main road by wooden crates and long shadows. Then, without releasing his hand, Barty said, I was talking to him about family, because his isn't great either, and he understands. You can talk to me about family, Peter interrupted, finally finding words for his jealousy. He released a shaking breath, watching as it puffed out visibly in the air between them. For a moment, Barty's eyes were obscured, and then they appeared again, wide and intense. I do talk to you. Peter swallowed. He wanted to shove his hand in his pocket because it was so cold out, but he didn't want to let go of Barty, and that writhing thing in his gut was back, except now it was in his chest and squirming, and he had so many things to say, but he didn't know how to say any of them. He froze, as suddenly there was much less distance between them. No, there was no distance between them because there was a cool mouth pressing against his own, and the hand in his was holding on so tightly that his tendons were protesting. Then his body caught up with what was happening, and his other hand came out of his pocket to grip the front of Barty's cloak and pull him even closer, drinking in the muffled sound of surprise as they stumbled into the wall at Peter's back, sighing into the warm air that was being shared between them. He forgot about the cold, he forgot about the jealousy, at least for the moment. He instead focused as much as he could on the boy that was with him, the mixed boldness and reticence of those lips as they slid over his, firm and decisive one moment, and almost hesitant the next. It wasn't long before they warmed against his, 
especially once they parted, and Peter felt the searing heat of the tip of a tongue tentatively brush along the seam of his lips. The squirming thing in his chest had melted and flooded his veins, and was now thrumming through his entire body. Each swipe of Barty's tongue against his, the shy touches of fingertips against his cheeks, even the way their knees knocked together had him reeling, dizzy with it all. When they finally broke apart, he sucked in lungs full of air, so cold that his lungs might have been full of knives, but he was still so warm that he felt like he would burn from the inside out. I'm sorry, Barty said quietly, and it took several seconds for Peter to piece together the sounds into words. What? Sorry for... The other boy made a sound of frustration somewhere in his throat. He hadn't stepped back yet, and was still leaning into Peter. It's not that I didn't trust you. I really do, Peter. Really. But I just... I don't know. I guess I don't really have a good reason for talking to Black. I'm sorry for making you think that I don't trust you. Barty wasn't meeting his gaze, and Peter found himself shutting his eyes while he continued to catch his breath. He could hear the distant sounds of conversation and laughter from the high street, but it was far away, dampened slightly by the snow and the thudding of his heartbeat in his ears. When he no longer felt like he was gasping, he opened his eyes and looked straight into the hazel ones that were still very near, the set of Barty's brow making him appear nervous. I understand, and I didn't mean to get upset, but you can talk to me. Anything you say is in confidence, I promise. Barty smiled then, and it was a radiant thing. It warmed Peter's fingers and ears, just as it made his blood hum in his veins. This time, he was the one to move forward, and he pressed a kiss to those smiling lips. Their study sessions in the library continued. They also found other opportunities to spend time together. At first, Peter was nervous, worried about the gossip, what people might say about him. He prepared for it, planned out excuses ahead of time, but nothing came of it. Not from those who called him Pudgy Peter behind his back. Not even from his friends. No, the rest of the marauders were so wrapped up in their eagerness to join the Order of the Phoenix, they didn't seem to notice that Peter was spending more time outside of Gryffindor Tower. And strangely, he found that he didn't even resent them for it. Instead, he felt a bit guilty, since it was his own fault that they were drifting apart, even if they didn't seem to have realised it yet. He felt sad, sad that they didn't see eye to eye on the wall, that they couldn't see eye to eye. So he tried to focus on what he did have available to him as his options after Hogwarts. While he didn't feel comfortable leaving the country, not with the knowledge that his family would be left behind, he didn't want to give up on his interests. He looked into the avenues for self-study, of various disciplines, further studies he could undertake on his own while he worked a job that would be safe. He could even work in his parents' shop in Diagon Alley. Shop assistant was a job that would be far beneath the notice of anyone on either side of the war, and he'd be there to help his parents and honour the wish of his grandfather. Peter came to that decision near the end of March, the day before the Hogwarts Express would be carrying students away for Easter break. That evening, he set off to see Barty with a sense of resolve, something that didn't necessarily fill him with excitement, but it did make him feel calm, almost confident. He found the other boy in a corridor filled with tapestries and paintings on the first floor. Barty was looking up at one of the latter, a depiction of a group of Roman wizards in assorted tunics, togas and armour, the figure at the centre clutching his chest in a dramatic pose. The blonde spun around as he approached, and his face lit up, but before he could say anything, Peter had his arms around his waist and was tumbling through the nearby tapestry into a dark alcove. Peter, what? I figured it out, he said vaguely, the words interspread between deep kisses. It'll be okay. He could feel Barty's fingers clutching at the front of his robes and had the creeping thought that maybe this was too much. But as soon as he started to back off, those fingers tightened, holding him close. And then he began to feel around, seeking the buttons of his robes. That's good, Barty mumbled into his mouth. Peter's own fingers tightened briefly at Barty's waist, hesitated before sliding them around to cup his arse, pulling their pelvises together. The hands on his chest skated off to the side as Barty gasped 
and he felt the scrape of teeth against his bottom lip when the blonde broke the kiss, almost panting. Is this okay? Peter said quietly. It was completely dark in the alcove. He could feel a hardness jutting into his stomach, but he could also hear the trembling breaths of the other boy, and he could feel their unsteadiness against his flushed cheek. So he waited, not wanting to push, not wanting to do anything to frighten or upset Barty, or ruin whatever was building between them. Just let me make sure no one hears us, he heard some thirty seconds later, Barty's voice noticeably higher than usual. He was shifting in the darkness, hands lifting from his chest, though the other boy didn't pull away any further than that. Then the hands returned, but rather than continuing with their efforts to undo Peter's robes, they instead travelled lower, until one was at his hip, the other palming his erection. Peter's breath stuttered, and his hands squeezed reflexively, prompting a sharp intake of breath in front of him. Then, nervously, he rocked into that hand. It was clear that this was as unfamiliar to Barty as it was to him. They were uncoordinated, and there was a fumbling sort of awkwardness to the experience that was both embarrassing and also strangely arousing. Peter tried to reclaim Barty's mouth in the darkness but missed, catching the corner of his jaw, then his cheek, and ended up settling with his face pressed to the taller boy's neck as they rocked together, his world condensed to the sensations of heat and friction and closeness and that building pressure. And somewhere behind his left temple, he could feel the feathery touches of Barty's lips as he let out the softest, breathiest whimpers against the shell of his ear. Then he heard the other boy's breath catch, his motions becoming more erratic, and it wasn't long before Peter was coming as well, warmth spreading in his pants as he tried to stifle a whine into Barty's robes. They remained there, Barty caging Peter against the wall, the alcove silent but for the sounds of their ragged breathing. He didn't want to pull his face away from where it was tucked into the folds of cloth, despite the darkness, knowing how red it had to be. His heart was hammering somewhere in his throat, surely loud enough for Barty to hear. When it didn't seem like Barty was going to move away, Peter slid his hands upwards until they wrapped around his waist once more. Then he took a slow breath in, held it for a few seconds, and let it out. Then he did it again. Finally, slightly less like he was going to combust from nerves, he finally straightened, lifting a hand to find Barty's cheek and smoothing a thumb blindly over his lips. They were thin, as though pursed. He lowered his hand, then drew his wand, carefully pulling the damp area of his clothing away from his body before casting a quiet scourgify, then doing the same for Barty. Then he swallowed. You all right? He felt the slight puff of air against his temple. Yes, I just... I haven't... I didn't think. His heart lurched. Barty, I'm so sorry, I thought you... No, stop! Barty interrupted, sharply enough that the tone startled Peter into silence more than the words themselves. No, I'm not upset or anything. I just... I didn't realise you'd... Well, I just didn't think this far ahead, I suppose. But I enjoyed it, really. Peter wished he could see the other boy's expression. But by the time he pulled aside the corner of the tapestry and let in the warm light from the corridor... Barty looked flushed, but at ease. That didn't help assuage his worries that he'd done something that Barty hadn't been comfortable with. But any further queries as they emerged from the alcove were met with firm declarations that everything was fine. Everything was... fine. Those were words that he tried to live by for his years in Hogwarts, and the more Peter was reminded of them, the more he knew that he was just delaying the inevitable... He just wished he knew what the inevitable was. The marauders usually spent the last part of the Easter break together at the Potter Cottage in Godric's Hollow. This year, that visit was interrupted when, on the Friday, halfway through the break, a special edition of the Evening Prophet brought news of an attack. An attack in London. An attack that saw werewolves massacring a cathedral full of muggles attending the evening liturgy for Good Friday just as the full moon began its ascent into the night sky. An attack that would likely see more turned among the Aurors, Order members, and others who would have arrived to offer aid and attempt to halt the crisis. Peter thought of Remus, 
of the protections over his dad's home that kept everyone safe from him during the full moon. He thought of what it would do to his friend, how much deeper into his self-hatred this would likely cause him to sink. He thought of how the severity of the incident seemed to be gradually increasing ever since the first open attack three years earlier. He thought of the fact that in less than three months, he would be out of time. As soon as Peter stepped off the train and onto the platform in Hogsmeade, he knew he needed to see Barty. They had exchanged a few letters during the break, but they contained nothing of consequence, nothing of the worries that were tumbling through Peter's mind, nor the tension that was surely present in the Crouch household following the attack in London and the horrendous aftermath. He sat in his usual seat at dinner, facing away from the centre of the Great Hall and from the Ravenclaw table. But after he and his friends returned to Gryffindor Tower, he borrowed the Marauder's map from James's trunk long enough to locate Barty and set off in the direction of the Quidditch pitch. When he arrived, he found the other boy sitting in the stands watching what appeared to be a pickup match between a handful of mixed Slytherins and Ravenclaws. Hi, Peter. Barty said as he sat down next to him, not looking away from the players. Hi, he echoed, his hands twisting together briefly until he forced himself to sit still and instead set them on the bench on either side of them. How was your break? A small smile flitted briefly over Barty's face and the mere sight of it in the face of that question eased some of the tension that Peter was feeling. It wasn't too bad. My father was hardly at home during the first week and I didn't see him during the second at all. That's good, he said quietly, then blinked, startled, as a glove hand found his on the bench and gave it a small squeeze. And yours? Peter didn't know what to say, that he hadn't already said months earlier, but it seemed that his silence was enough, since Barty then squeezed his hand again. No more words were shared, at least not for the duration of the match, and they continued to sit there while the players landed and packed up the quaffle and snitch in the cases at the edge of the pitch. A few of the players waved up at the stands before heading towards the castle and Barty waved back, that smile shifting into something more resolute. When the group was out of sight, no longer within range of the limited lighting on the pitch, Barty cleared his throat. So, the attack? Peter swallowed. Yeah. Barty glanced at him, then away as he stood. What with me? I want to talk, and I'd rather be out of the cold. He nodded and followed as the taller boy led away to the stairs, then down to the wet grass. But rather than continuing towards the castle, they headed towards the changing rooms that were inside a dark space with only the light of a lumos between them. But it wasn't cold, and it was away from prying eyes and ears. While Peter looked around the space, taking in the long shadows extending from their feet, he noted Barty silently casting that privacy spell he was so fond of. Then... Barty said again, The attack. Peter nodded, gripping his wand a little tighter, the light emanating from its tip bouncing slightly and causing the shadows to dance. The Ministry has managed to keep the numbers away from the reporters, for now, but from the little I was able to gather when my father spoke to my mother over the flu, at least a dozen were turned. And while that carnage was taking place, there was another attack that's being covered up, Peter's stomach clenched uncomfortably. Covered up? Barty nodded, then bit his lip, his expression shifting to one that was piercing in its intensity. The sub-basement of St Mungo's was raided. Peter just shook his head, not understanding. So Barty clarified. The morgue. At first, he still didn't understand, because he was thinking of all the deaths to date. The torture. The disappearances the destroyed homes and the... the carnage, as Barty had phrased it. He was thinking of all the victims, not about who was causing it all. Then he turned his thoughts to the self-proclaimed Dark Lord, the person that everyone was too frightened to actually name. He recalled the whispers about dark magic rising again, rumours he'd heard since he was young, since before the war had even begun. He thought of the bodies and dark magic, and what combination of the two could mean. Necromancy, he whispered, and Barty just watched him, somehow managing to appear calm, with that lingering in the air. How? 
He didn't really know what he meant with that question. How could someone be capable of raising the dead? How could someone steal a stranger's dead loved one? How could anyone hope to face a threat like that and live? How could anyone even have hope if a danger like that existed? Barty was peeling off his gloves as his mind spun in circles. He tucked each of them away in a pocket. Then he took a step closer, one hand closing around Peter's that was holding his wand and keeping the light between them, the other curling into the front of his cloak. You said, the taller boy began quietly, intently, that what you wanted to do was survive. Is that still how you feel? Peter could feel the warmth of Barty's touch, just barely. More than that, though, he was feeling the sudden weight of the decision that he'd been telling himself he still had time to make. The decision that he wanted to not have to make at all. Barty watched him, his hazel eyes flitting rapidly between Peter's, likely reading his inner turmoil. It might not be possible to hide for much longer, not with how far both sides of the war are reaching to find allies. I know, Peter whispered, and he did know, though it seemed while one force had all manner of dark creatures aiding them, the Ministry was resorting to younger aura recruits, reduced application requirements, shortened training courses, all in an attempt to recover the numbers of experienced veterans they were losing weekly. There was also the undeniable fact that their Ministry had seen a notable lack of international aid, while fighting a threat that seemed to acquire formidable allies from beyond Britain every other month. And when one side can raise those who fall so that they can continue to fight after death. A shiver ran down Peter's spine as that sense of inevitability that had been hanging over him finally settled, sinking its claws into his mind. He couldn't keep running from this decision, because soon enough it would outrun him, and he'd be carried along with it whether he was alive or not. And so, the decision. To fight with his friends, for his friends, the marauders. To fight alongside the order, and be the person that everyone would always rather he be. The person that he always tried to be. Pretended to be. Since that person was the confident one. The happy one. Or to survive. I want to survive. He'd thought before that choosing the Order of the Phoenix would have been the option that would have taken the most courage, because that meant fighting and giving his life to a good cause. A lost cause. But as Barty whispered a soft knox and they were plunged into darkness, he felt the weight of what he'd decided, what future that decision meant. And while he wasn't risking his life, he was most certainly risking everything else. They were pressed up against the wall, making up for lost time, hands mapping out skin that was quickly divested of its many layers of clothing, mouths reconnecting and tasting and murmuring words, promises back and forth. Words like, this summer, and it's the only real option. Promises like, I'll survive with you, and we'll do this together. More words still, as they tumbled back together onto the mats used for pre- and post-mat stretches, still in the dark, always in the dark, completely wrapped up in each other, and that single spark of hope, all of the words sealing Peter's fate. We'll join them, and the Death Eaters, and yes. The rest of the term went by quickly. All too soon, Peter was sitting his notes, somehow managing to find the time to eat and sleep between revision sessions with the rest of the seventh years. And then, the exams were finally behind him, and he recalled what it had been like at the end of his fifth year, when OWLs were done, and yet they still had several weeks left to spend in the castle. Of course, because their NEWTs were complete, there was little reason to slip away from the other marauders, since obviously he couldn't be working on any assignments. And so, he was forced to content himself with shared glances with Barty when their paths crossed. Though, he did manage to find a few minutes to share some quick kisses and even quicker words after Barty's final OWL. Instead, he passed time with the marauders outside by the lake, or wandering through Hogsmeade, or lazing around in Gryffindor Tower. There were a few conversations about the Order, a topic on which Peter remained non-committal whenever it surfaced. 
with an excuse about wanting to return home and talk to his parents first before he decided anything. He was all smiles, happy, easy smiles, because he was a marauder, and that's what being a marauder was all about. Under it all, he was a simmering ball of anticipation and nervousness and doubt and overwhelming relief, because his worries would be over soon. Soon ended up being almost a week after his return home. He received an invitation to visit Barty at the Crouch home and travelled there by flu one evening after dinner. He emerged from the fireplace and was introduced by a frail but lovely woman who welcomed him in with a warm smile and a soft palm to his cheek and then even softer words of Thank you for making my boy so happy. A bit of warmth joined the other emotions that were bouncing in his chest, soothing the more anxious ones bolstering those that assured him that he was making the right choice. Then Barty bounded down the stairs, a pack slung over his shoulder, and grabbed his hand before dragging him through the house and to the back garden. Without letting go of his hand, Barty asked, Are you ready? Peter swallowed, then smiled. A true smile, not a marauder one. Together. Barty's eyes were bright, almost luminous as he twisted them into apparition, and Peter had only a brief moment to wonder why Barty was the one apparating them, when he was still underage, before he was distracted, instead taking in the sight around him. A garden, sculpted hedges, interwoven with thorny vines, brazes, each one ornate and holding dancing flames, flames that were actually dancing creatures, or spirits. Fiendfire. A part of his mind whispered, but it was a small part, and his thoughts were pulled away as Barty led him forward. The stone path they were following opened into an enclosed courtyard, the only other exit appearing to be a set of double doors set into the wall of a house. But there wasn't enough light from the braziers to illuminate much past the first few feet above the door, so Peter couldn't guess at the size of the property. In truth, he had no idea where he was, nor did he really know what to expect and the uncertainty was starting to set him on edge. He glanced over at Barty, and whatever question he was going to ask died in his throat, because Barty was smiling brighter than he'd ever seen before. And then the doors opened, and a towering figure that immediately filled him with horror emerged. Ah, oh, Barty, you're just on time, came a high voice. It was completely unfamiliar as was the pale, waxy face that spoke, but it was chilling all the same, as Peter knew that he would never forget it. And you've brought me a guest! Barty released his hand, and let the bag that he brought slide from his shoulder as he stepped forward. Then he dropped to his knees at the newcomer's feet, and bowed his head over the hand that was extended before him, clasping it and pressing a kiss to it. I did, my lord. This is Peter Pettigrew, as promised. You've done well, child. Lord Voldemort is proud of you. The words were one that a father might speak to his son, but they were wrong, so wrong coming from this entity. The tone was wrong. The black cloak and mask that Barty was, was drawing from that bag were wrong. The mark that was black and there on his arm as he bared it for the Dark Lord was wrong. Through it all, the series of revelations... Of dawning realisation, Peter waited for Barty to look at him, to just meet his gaze, to give him that small reassurance that this would be fine, that this was what they talked about, and that, despite this one rather glaring omission, everything was fine. But it seemed that Barty only had eyes for the Dark Lord. It wasn't long before he was beckoned closer and told to pledge his fealty. Then he had a dark mark bestowed upon him, and was given a mask and cloak, and most importantly, his role, to watch and report. It was a bit after those interactions that the other masked and cloaked individuals arrived, and Peter joined them in the circle that wrapped along the perimeter of the courtyard, disappearing among them as he tried his hardest to disappear at Hogwarts to no avail. There were reports from some of those present, Snippets of updates, some of which he understood, and far more that he didn't. What struck him was how many of the voices were familiar to him, 
whether he could place the speaker's faces in his mind or not. These weren't all nameless strangers. Neither did they all seem like the dangerous, maniacal dark wizards that were regularly portrayed in the Daily Prophet. As a witch spoke in a soft, steady voice about timetables and supplies, Peter glanced over to the tall, masked form of Barty, still positioned near the Dark Lord. He wondered whether he would have made the same decision if the other boy had been honest with him, if he'd explained what his oath could do for Peter, if he swore it, if he'd been straightforward and told him about the others, and how human so many of them were. Those around Peter in the courtyard, they were people, individuals, Some might have very well been like him, ordinary, just trying to survive. He wanted to tell Barty that he understood, that this had clearly been important to him, that he understood how the other boy had found a place to belong here in a way that he didn't within his own family. Peter wanted to say that he was here too, as they'd promised, that even though their circumstances had changed, that they would no longer be in school together, that they hadn't had complete honesty between them. He still wanted to be there for Barty. And yet Barty never turned. His mask never shifted to face Peter throughout the meeting. He might have been a complete stranger. By the end of the night, once they'd all been dismissed and he glanced back towards Barty one last time, Peter felt emotionally drained after having been tightly wound with anxiety and uncertainty for so long. And yet, as he and countless others disappeared, he felt at his core that he'd made the right decision. Even with the lies, the broken trust, the heartbreak, even with the cost. Because he'd survive. Years later, when he shared a secret, the secret, He finally truly realised what the cost had been all along. Not his friends, certainly not his freedom. It had cost him his humanity. Hey there guys, gals and non-binary pals. It's Eleanor and I hope you're having a lovely day today. Holy she, this fic? Wow. Wow. Can we just round of applause because... Listen, I told you that I'm in my Peter Pettigrew era right now. Like, I'm obsessed with him. And and whilst I personally refuse to believe he actually betrayed the Potters, but I'll put my tinfoil hat away for now, this is just mm, such a good exploration of him as a person. And, you know, if he did. Which, to be fair, even if he did, I do think it's quite interesting to look at a perspective like this to think about Peter as a person and what it would mean for you emotionally to be somebody in the middle of a war not wanting any part of it but being forced to pick a side in it and feeling like there is no options for you and that if you don't die for the cause, that means you are an inherently nasty person, which is pretty messed up. <laughs> and, you know, I love Peter, I think it's great. I think he needs more characterization and more being treated like a person and not as a punching bag an excuse to make fat jokes which is how he's usually portrayed and it upsets me (laughs) and so this fic oh god the tears the heartbreak the betrayal of peter at the end like that was so upsetting to me i was like buddy how could you do this (laughs) i trusted you and i knew we couldn't trust him obviously but like i was still holding out hope because i was like please come on you guys because I mean I am on my uh Peter and Barty legs. I I just actually ship them. I know. We met on TikTok. I know it started as a crack ship and everyone was like, oh Peter and Barty. But I'm not gonna lie. I genuinely ship it. I think they'd actually be really good together. Um and I I do like 
concept of Barty being somebody who sees Peter and uh, especially because there is a lot of this idea around Peter that none of his achievements mean anything because he got help for any of it which is kind of weird <laughs> like oh well you know he became an animagus but he's not that impressive because someone helped him which I mean bit of a weird one for me but I really like Peter I think he's fun and I refuse to believe he betrayed the potters but if he did at least make me cry about it like I did here did you cry am I gonna slowly start changing your mind on Peter Pettigrew is this gonna be my new All Might soapbox is now I just like talk about how <laughs> we need to start loving Peter Pettigrew because he deserves it but please, please, please let me know what you thought of this fic in the comments down below. Um, and how you're doing. I miss you guys. Look at me. I'm back. I'm making content. I'm doing stuff. Please go ahead and like the video if you liked it. And to boost my serotonin levels. You can also subscribe to be notified whenever I make new videos. And uh, comments. Yeah, those are fun. And all the links are in the description for everything. And uh, until I see you again, be sure to practice some self-care. Be sure to go to bed on time. Drink lots of water because you need some hydration. And eat your five a day. Fruits and veg, get it done. You're going to be in trouble. Yes, this is a threat. And I will catch you guys. A latest.